Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar presentation will cover both static and dynamic techniques. Currently, Teledyne Techmar offers headspace analysis with our HT3 Techspace Analyzer. This instrument is unique as it offers both static and dynamic modes of analysis. Some of you who are new to headspace analysis may have a question as to why you would even want to do headspace. Well, there are many means by which analytes are going to be injected into your GC. Most of your analysis is performed by direct injection with some uh, prior sample preparation. However, this technique may result in dirty injectors and or columns due to non-volatile residues that also can be injected along with your analytes of interest. Now, Headspace allows you to exclude unwanted materials into your injection. Because Headspace creates a gas phase injection, only the volatile components reach the GC. This means that any non-volatile material will remain inside that sample vial. Now, because the sample is in a sealed vial, other chemicals or solvents can be added to your sample to adjust for matrix conditions or to enhance or suppress the response of a given compound. Now, this type of analysis is very useful to selectively adjust your response factors. Using test-based analysis, high concentrations of analytes can be analyzed without fear of carryover. Again, this is because the injector sees only the gas phase of the sample. Now you may ask, why is head space, what is headspace analysis? Well, before we move on today, I'd like to give you a brief overview of headspace analysis in general. And that is that it's a sample preparation, preparation technique for both GC and GCMS. It's primarily for volatile organics, although you can use it for an extended range of uh, higher boiling compounds that are not typically considered uh, volatile. Generally speaking, um, for headspace analysis, the sample is placed in a glass vial, which is sealed with a Teflon-faced septum. And then that gas above the sample, which is typically air, is called the headspace. Now that sealed vial is then heated to a temperature appropriate for both the matrix and the analyte. The volatiles um, in that sample are then going to leave the sample and migrate into the headspace above it. This headspace is sampled by placing a needle into that vial, which is pressurized. And this allows the sample to fill a fixed volume loop if you're using a static technique, or to continuously be swept onto an analytical trap if you're using the dynamic technique. Now, the Teledyne Techmar HT3, again, is a fully automated headspace analyzer, offering both static and dynamic analysis within a single schedule. Therefore, you're able to do both loop and trap techniques. It's important for you to understand the different modes that the HT3 offers, as both static and dynamic modes have their inherent advantages. So I'd like to briefly discuss the differences between the two for you today. There are primary considerations in any type of headspace analysis that play important roles onto um, determining what type of analysis you can do and which mode you should choose. Just a few might be temperature, your heating time, and partition coefficients, or K values. Now, the temperature can affect headspace analysis, because as you increase the temperature of your sample, you're also increasing the amount within the vapor phase of your target analytes. Remember, though, that as you increase your sample temperature, you're also increasing the amount of water that is going to go over onto your trap or onto your GC system. So try to slightly increase that temperature of your sample while you're optimizing your technique. A slight increase in temperature can greatly improve the recoveries of your polar compounds. Now, if you remember, the partition coefficient represents the ratio of the concentration or solubilities of an analyte between the sample matrix and the solvent. 
Now, those analytes with smaller k-values will be least soluble in water. These will tend to be your least volatile target analytes. However, they're going to be your most sensitive as well. Now, again, the partition coefficient has factors that can affect it as well. A couple of those um, can be temperature as well um, and salinity, to name a few. Now, this is a good listing of partition coefficients for organics in water at 50 degrees Celsius. Notice here that the alcohols, which are very soluble in water, are going to have the largest K values. This table is nice because it gives you a complete understanding of what the K value and the role it plays in headspace analysis. How easy and um, well those are soluble in water. As I mentioned before, with the HT3, you have both static and dynamic capabilities. Now, the HT3 comes standard with static headspace, which is also referred to as the loop system. This is going to be a brief overview of how the system works. I'd like to go over what kinds of analysis can be performed using the loop technique and how to optimize certain method parameters within this system mode. Now, for static headspace applications, there are typical uh, applications that are common to this type of analysis. With static headspace, you can perform uh, many applications, including, but not limited to, pharmaceuticals, environmental, forensics, which do include uh, blood alcohols, polymer and plastics, and even flavor and fragrances. And to give you an understanding of the steps of headspace analysis, I'd like to go over those with you. Again, this is an abbreviated um, set of steps for this type of analysis. It's not every step that the analyzer goes through, but it'll give you um, an overview of uh, what's going on in this process so that you can compare it later to the dynamic um, mode. Now, with static headspace analysis, the sample is placed into a vial and sealed. That sample is then delivered to the auto sampler, where it is then loaded into a platen for heating. Now, upon reaching a final set heating time, it's then going to be mixed for a set period of time. Using our electronic mass flow controller, the static vial pressure is going to be recorded, and that sample is pressurized to a user-defined set point. The sample is is then going to be vented through a fixed volume loop. Remember, that's because we're doing the static headspace analysis. And then it will go on to another user-defined final pressure set point. Now, the loop contains the sample at this point, and it's then going to be valve actuated. This is so that it can be placed in line with the GC column to go on for separation and detection. This is an animated flow diagram to show you the internal flow path for the HT3 while in the static mode. Headspace optimization can be used when, uh, with the HT3 by tailoring the instrumental parameters to your sample. The HT3 offers the ability to tune your sample analysis by varying many of the instrument parameters. I'd like to go over a few of those with you today. Those will include the valve and transfer line temperatures, the sample temperature itself, which is your platen temperature, the sample equilibration time, vial pressurization, sample mixing, sample loops, and loop fill pressure. The sample temperature, if you remember, plays an important role on any type of headspace analysis. As the higher temperatures of the sample will shift the equilibrium to favor the headspace, this temperature is going to be limited by the boiling point of your sample solvent and the thermal stability of the sample components. The equilibration time is the time required to reach equilibrium, and it's going to be dependent on your sample matrix, the analytes, and the temperature. The vial pressurization 
is the pressurization of the vial, which is going to assure that the sample completely fills that sample loop and keeps all the samples and standards consistent in pressure. This is extremely important for reproducibility. Sample mixing can be achieved through the use of the OptiMix system, which is going to allow for variable power settings from 1 to 10. Sample loops are available in different sizes according to your um, type of analysis. Currently, we have a 100, a 250, and a 500 microliter sample loop, as well as the larger uh, loop sizes, which can include 1, 2, 3, and 5 mil loop sizes. Finally, the loop fill pressure is going to be the pressure that the sample in the vial is going to decrease to to help fill that loop. When optimizing your static headspace method parameters, it's important to understand how each of these can affect your analysis. This is a um, screenshot of the method parameters available in the static headspace mode. I'd like to go over some of these uh, with you today so you can get an understanding of how these can affect the analysis directly. The valve, which is the oven and transfer line temperature, play an important role. Um, the valve and transfer line temperatures generally are set at the same value or even higher than the sample equilibration temperature. This is going to ensure that there are no cold spots. It's important to remember that the valve and transfer line temperatures are also going to be around the same temperature um, as your GC inlet temperature to avoid a cold spot connection there as well. If the oven and transfer line temperatures are lower than your inlet temperature, you may introduce a cold spot and not um, achieve adequate chromatography. Remember, um, keeping everything in a tight band and at its equal temperatures is going to have uh, excellent peak shape and response for you. Now, one parameter to consider is the temperature at which the sample will be heated. While headspace can be performed at ambient temperature, it is not particularly effective uh, for every type of analysis. So sometimes it may be required for elevated temperature so that you can shift that equilibrium in favor of the headspace to get more of the target analytes into that headspace and onto the system. But remember that the temperature is going to be limited by the boiling point of your sample solvent and the thermal stability of your sample components. So if you're doing a new type of analysis, make sure you know what the boiling point of your solvent is before you begin and before you set those temperatures for your sample. The sample equilibration time is the um, amount of time the sample has to equilibrate at a particular temperature. And it's totally dependent on the sample matrix, the analytes that are being determined, and the temperature. Now, at equilibrium, the analyte concentration in the headspace is at a maximum, and it will not change significantly with longer heating times. However, if the sample does not equilibrate within a reasonable amount of time, the headspace, headspace can still be sampled, just as long as the equilibration time is kept constant for all of your samples. Pressurizing the vial contents with an inert gas prior to filling that sample loop is going to help ensure that the loop gets filled completely with sample. Now, pressurization also improves your reproducibility, since solid samples may not yield consistent static pressure upon heating. Now, remember the pressurization only needs to be set 2 to 4 psi above the static pressure. Too high of a pressurization setting can result in dilution of the headspace contents with inert pressurizing gas. Sample mixing is a parameter available to assist you with troublesome matrices. The HG3 offers various mixing levels. To use this option, simply select the Mixer On tab, and then the appropriate mixing variables will now become available to you. By optimizing the sample mixing time and levels, you can increase the amount of target analytes going into the headspace. 
This is extremely useful when you have a solid matrices. In terms of the sample loops used in headspace analyzers, you have to balance the factors described on this slide. When the analyzer steps to fill the sample loop after the vial has been pressurized, probably the best way to determine the optimal loop fill time is going to be for you to attach a flow meter to the vent and monitor the flow. Now remember, larger loops, like your 3 and 5 mil loops, are going to provide larger volumes going over to your GC, while your smaller loops, your 100, 250, 500 microliter, and even a 1 mil loop are going to provide better chromatographic resolution for you. Now to give you an idea of what the chromatography looks like in the static mode, here is a sample for a 40 ppm class 1 residual solvent standard. Here we've used the loop mode and you can clearly see 1,1 dichloroethylene, 1,1,1 trichloroethane, we have carbon tetrachloride in this mix, as well as benzene and 1,2-dichloroethane. Here we've indicated good chromatographic results and nice peak shape and response, again using the HT3 in, in the static mode. Remember in the static mode you're going to get the um, higher concentrations, you're going to be able to look at 40 ppm, while later we're going to show um, increased sensitivity with the dynamic mode where we're going to be looking at PPB levels. Now moving along then to talk about the dynamic headspace analysis, this is also available as an option on the HT3. This process is somewhat different than static headspace analysis, and I'd like to discuss that in detail with you now. For those of you not familiar with the dynamic mode or trapping module of the HT3, I've included a photo for you. Notice this is still the standard 12-inch trap required for many of EPA's methods. The coil, if you've noticed, around the trap is the heater. This heater provides nice uniform heating for the entire length of the 12-inch trap. This trapping module is located directly behind the front door of the unit on the HT3. In the dynamic mode, com upon completion of heating and mixing the headspace, uh, heating and mixing the sample, I'm sorry, that headspace is going to be continuously swept with an inert sample gas. Now remember the Steps that go completely before this are the same as static headspace analysis, where that sample is placed into the vial and sealed. Now, once that heating and mixing has been achieved, the headspace is then swept with the sample gas, and that gas is then routed through a sorbent trap, where it's removing more of the analyte continuously and concentrating it on that trap over a period of time. That trap is then going to be heated and back flushed with carrier gas to the GC column for separation and detection. Now the dynamic mode utilizes the standard 12-inch trap as I mentioned before. The HT3 ships with a Vocarb 3000 or also known as a K-trap in place. However, the new number 9 Teledyne Tecmar proprietary trap uh, is now also available for the HT3. Again, we've included another animated flow diagram, this time while in the dynamic or trapping mode. Take a moment to see how the system is pressurized and how the sample is delivered to the analytical trap and then further desorbed over to the GC system. Now with dynamic headspace, we can offer improved sensitivity, lower MDLs, and increased dynamic range. And what we really mean here by increased dynamic range is while we're able to see PPM levels with the static analysis, we're able to see PPM and PPB levels with a dynamic headspace analysis. Dynamic headspace analysis is also a great replacement for multiple headspace extraction techniques. There are multiple sorbent choices for varying analysis. There are many, many traps that are available for headspace analysis, and we'll go over some of those in detail in a few moments. Remember, with headspace, you're continually sweeping and concentrating those analytes onto that absorbent trap. 
This is what's going to help with your improved sensitivity and your lower NDL. A dynamic headspace optimization can also be accomplished using the HT3 by tailoring the method parameters for the dynamic mode as well. As we went over the different modes of analysis and parameters for static headspace analysis, I'd like to go over some in the dynamic mode for you as well. Today we're going to discuss sweep flow rate and sweep flow time, dry purge time, dry purge flow, dry purge temperature, as well as go into some factors for desorb, such as preheat, temperature, and time, and then factors that are going to help with trap baking as far as temperature and time are concerned. Again, this is a screenshot of the HT3 for the method variables that you can alter for optimizing your system in the dynamic mode. Understanding how these parameters affect your sample analysis is very important. I'd like to point out, though, and please remember, that if you're using EPA or uh, methods or even SOPs or specific guidelines for your uh, particular business, some of these parameters may not, you may not be permitted to alter. So make sure that you keep um, in guidelines and in accordance to methodologies uh, and only change the variables which are um, in accordance with those methods and um, SOPs. Now the trap standby temperature is going to be that temperature that the trap must reach before the next sample can begin. Now this is going to assure that each sample is run under the same temperature and same conditions. A good setting for that trap during standby is going to be about 35 to 45 degrees C. Now the sweep volume is dependent on two variables. It's dependent on the sweep flow rate and the sweep flow time. Those are two variables that you can alter in dynamic headspace analysis. Now, the sensitivity of your, um, your analysis can then be controlled by the sweep uh, volume. So if you're trying to increase the sensitivity, remember to adjust both the sweep flow rate and the sweep flow time. Now, the sweep flow time is going to be the time that that gas is sweeping the sample headspace. And I'd like to discuss some factors for dry purge that are going to affect your analysis. Now, remember, during dry purge, there are several parameters that can be optimized. The amount of time and rate that the dry gas is passed through the trap helps to remove excess water, which can greatly affect your GC analysis. Too high of a dry purge volume, which again is your flow and time, can cause weakly absorbed compounds to escape from the trap and to be vented. Dry purge flow is going to be the rate at which that dry gas sweeps the trap to remove the water. The dry purge temperature is important because it helps to remove as much water from the sample as possible. Water removal and trap temperature are very important in volatile organic analysis. Usually a good purge temperature is better on the lower, I'm sorry, dry purge temperature is better on the lower end of the scale, usually around 20 to 40 degrees C. Again, this is a parameter that, you're avail that if available to vary, um, you should, because it's going to help with uh, problems in your water analysis. Desorb preheat is the temperature um, that's usually kept around 5 degrees C lower than your desorb temperature. Because during the um, desorb preheat mode, the target analytes are concentrated onto that analytical trap. And they're ready. They're just sitting there. They're about to be released to the GC system. So it's important to keep them warm and in a ready state. Now, once they're ready to go all over, it's important that the desorb temperature is set appropriately. Because during the desorb mode, desorb preheat is um, getting everything ready, but now in the desorb mode, everything's getting ready to go over to the GC. 
So the trap needs to be at the right temperature before that eight uh, port valve rotates to allow the GC carrier gas to sweep the analytes off of that trap and onto the column. Now, too high of a desorb temperature can cause thermal degradation. So it's important to get that desorb temperature uh, appropriately. Now, your desorb time plays an important role. If this is the time that it's going to be re required for that eight port valve to rotate, that's going to allow the sample to be swept on the column. Too short of a time, and you may not collect your heavier compounds. Now, remember that with desorption time varies with your compounds, but it's also going to be dependent on the absorption efficiency of the trap itself. During the baking process, the trap is heated to a higher temperature setting than you've seen on your normal analysis run. It's going to be set for a um, high temperature and for a set period of time. This is to help remove any target analytes that are left on that trap from the previous sample um, to be removed and, and heated off prior to acquisition of your next sample. Now, this baking process helps with carryover issues, especially in your high concentrated or high end calibration level samples. It's important that you read the maximum flow and temperature settings that come along with your analytical traps as too much flow or overheating can damage your traps. Remember that the trap bake time is a variable that you can manipulate to fine tune your analysis. The trap bake time allows for the remaining targets to be baked off for a set period of time. Now, too short of a time and you can see carryover or ghost peaks on the subsequent samples. Now, if you have too long of a bake time, you're just simply extending your analysis time longer than need be. An average um, bake time for most uh, volatile organic analysis in a sufficient time is usually four to six minutes. A lot of times I'll, I'll see um, bake times of 10 minutes, which is fine, but uh, when I start to see 20 and 30 minute bake times, that's just probably way, way too long for the type of analysis that you may be doing. If you are um, doing polymers or plastics, something like that, you, you may need a longer bake time. Now, the trap bake flow is simply the gas flow rate at during um, the bake mode. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are a lot of trap choices when doing uh, dynamic headspace analysis. Now, some common traps that are used uh, today are going to be your VOCARP 3000, which is going to be what is typically seen for method 8260 or 502, uh, 524, 1035, et cetera. Now, the BTEX trap is designed for the analysis of your benzene on your xylene isomers. The number nine, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a proprietary trap by Teledyne Tecmar. It was designed as an improvement over the VOCARP 3000 trap. We do currently in QC and install that in our purging trap system. So if you feel that you're having issues with water management or not good retainment of your gases and you're currently using a VOCARP 3000 trap, I would recommend moving to the number nine trap to see if you get better um, recoveries for your target analytes. Now, all of these traps contain hydrophobic absorbents that are able to use to reduce the dry purge time, which is usually associated with removing the water. Now, removing or reducing this dry purge time is going to allow you to reduce your sample run time. So if you're a high throughput lab, this can be an important factor for you. Now, if you're in research or into method development, sometimes um, you may not quite be sure um, of what trap to, uh, to use for the particular type of analysis you're getting ready to undertake. So this is a really nice chart um, that can be useful for you because there are a wide variety of traps available for the HT3, as I mentioned. Um, this table is going to include trap numbers available for the instrument, the absorbents that are inside these traps, and what types of target analytes they're good at retaining. Um, as well as um, conditioning parameters for those traps. Now, just as 
well when you get a new trap is on this table. It will give you the flow rates and the temperatures recommended to condition these traps. Uh, it will also give you um, suggested bake times um, that you should use for these traps prior to the analysis of your first run. It also is going to provide you guidelines for dry purge times, uh, these are preheat temperatures and even bake temperatures themselves for regular analysis. It's a very useful tool. Now, as I showed you earlier in the presentation, I indicated chromatography in the static mode. Here we're looking at chromatographic results for the same class 1 residual solvents seen earlier, but now we're looking at them in the dynamic mode. Now, notice that um, previously I showed you these residual solvents at 40 ppm. Now you're looking at them at 10 and 20 ppb. So again, I mentioned earlier that in the dynamic mode, we have much better uh, levels of sensitivity. ppm for static and ppb for dynamic. So now we get to the point where you're going to ask yourself, OK, static or dynamic? Which one is for me? Well, there are going to be several factors to keep in mind when you're determining whether you want to choose static or dynamic headspace analysis. You need to think, what is my sample matrix? What are my target analytes? And what levels of detection do I need to achieve? Your sample matrix can be waters, plastics, aromatics. Which would be better suited, static or dynamic? My target analytes, are they better retained on a track? Do I need PPM levels or do I need PPB levels? Think of all of these before you uh, begin your, um, your initial uh, method development. Now, for a comparison of the two uh, modes, static and dynamic, remember dynamic headspace is going to be your more sensitive mode of analysis. As, as I've mentioned several times in the animated flow diagram, as well as verbally, that dynamic mode offers you better sensitivity because you're continuously sweeping that sample um, gas, uh, the headspace, onto the trap. And, and it's a continual sweeping of that um, headspace volume onto the trap, where um, in static, it's just one aliquot of that um, headspace. So you are going to get improved sensitivity with the dynamic mode over the static mode. Now, to show you an overlay of chromatography to give you a visual of exactly the difference between static and um, dynamic, here's a typical analysis run for some VOCs. Notice the response is much greater using the dynamic mode, as represented in the green chromatogram, than in the white chromatogram, which is your static mode analysis. Here's a nice table that will show you uh, both loop and trap for some common VOCs. Notice that the percent RSDs are really nice for both. But take a look at the top of the chart where you can see that for the loop, we're looking at 200 ppb to 2 ppm, while in the trap mode, we're looking at 5 to 100 ppb. Again, both RSDs are acceptable and very tight, very nice but the levels of detection are much lower in the trap mode. Here we've got a nice bar graph representing both the static and dynamic modes of the HT3. Looking at a 100 ppb sample containing alcohols. Now the percent difference between the two modes of analysis are quite traumatic, as represented by the yellow bar, which is your percent difference. Now, when trying to do your scheduling or your method development work, it can be tedious at first if you're thinking of all the method parameters that you want to vary to try to fine tune your instrument. However, with the HT3, the method parameter optimization can be formed quite easily through the use of our method optimization mode, often referred to as the MOM of the HT3. This is a new and improved feature for our HT3. It can be used for both the loop or trap mode, again, static or dynamic, of the instrument and can be used at the same time within a single schedule. So if you're doing first initial work on method development and you're not quite sure if you want to do static or dynamic, 
and you're not quite sure at the temperature at which you want to run your analysis or which um, other variables that you need to choose to optimize, you can come in here and choose both loop and vary those uh, method parameters. And then you can choose trap and vary those method parameters and build one single schedule. And I'd like to show you how that's done now. And now I pull down the menu for each field is going to walk you through the steps of the schedule building process. Here, again, depending on whether you're running in static or dynamic mode, the appropriate methods, which can either be your default methods or any of the methods that you've previously developed, are made available for you to choose from. Now, using that method variable pull-down window, you have several parameters that you can now optimize. This is giving you an example of the loop method builder. Here, you can do the method variables such as platen sample temperature, sample equilibration time, your mixing time or mixing level, your pressurized time, your loop fill pressure, and even your injection time. Those are all the variables that are available in the loop mode. Now, once you select the appropriate va uh, variable, you're now going to be able to select uh, the rate at which you want to vary that parameter. This is a nice tool, again, when um, first developing a method during research. This is an example of um, trying to vary your platen or your sample temperature. You're not quite sure what it's going to take to drive that um, target analyte into that headspace. So you might want to vary that temperature. Let's say we're going to go from um, 30 degrees to 100 degrees, and we want to go in five degree increments. Well, obviously, we don't want to have, um, you know, 15 different methods with um, these different uh, temperatures. And we don't sit, uh, want to have to sit there all day and manually enter each one of these values in. So we need a way to build the schedule and allow it to run um, on its own. So I'm going to show you how that's done. So this is the increments in which you wish to follow for your variable range. In your range, you'll have a start and stop value. Then you'll have a step value. This will be um, stepping, uh, let's say you want to go from 25 to 50. Your step value will be how many steps it's going to take. So if you wanted to go by 5 degrees C, you'd put the appropriate steps in there to get from 25 to 50 in 5 degree increments. Now, once all of the variables and steps have been selected, once you've put all your variables in for your loop method, and once you've put all the variables in for your trap, if you're doing both, and once you've selected all of the different step values and, and, and so forth in the starting positions of your vials, you're going to simply select the Apply button. Once you've hit the Apply button, this schedule builds itself and become available for you to click Start and Run. It's that easy. Lastly today, I'd like to discuss the additional benefits of the HT3. These include, but are not limited to, a built-in 60-position auto sampler, as well as a 10-position platen oven, which is going to allow you to heat up to 10. Again, it's a little static and dynamic. So we incorporate that mass flow controller that we discussed earlier. That's very important because it regulates either the flow or pressure. It's going to depend on your mode of analysis. Now, this feature monitors and controls those gas flow rates throughout the entire auto sampling process. With the HT3, you can also have the ability to analyze 9, 12, and 22 mil size vials. We have sample heating up to 300 degrees C. Very important when you're looking at something like polymers. We have that removable silica steel sample pathway, again, temperature controlled to 300 degrees C. The variable fill pressure control, and what we just discussed, the automated method optimization mode, the MOM schedule, very nice tool when doing method development or initial research work. And then we also offer standard and CFR software control. 
In summary, the HT3 Automated Headspace Analyzer offers controlling software allowing for multiple parameter changes as well as alternate vial sizes, all within a single schedule. It is a fixed loop system with an option for a trapping module to be added. Both of those types of analysis can be run on the same um, schedule. That static vial pressure is recorded for every single loop sample. And that constant heat feature is really nice because it's going to keep the HT3 and your GC cycle synchronized. That doesn't um, allow for any downtime of either instrument. Both of them will be running. When one is done with sample preparation, that GC cycle is going to go. And that GC cycle time is going to be timed so that when that's done, that next sample is ready to go. So there is no lost time between your headspace analyzer and your GC, which is great if you're a high throughput lab. And lastly here, if you're interested in any additional HG3 application notes, this is a listing for our website where you can download these applications that may be um, of interest to you. And certainly, if you have any ideas or any um, desires for some applications in the future that you may have interest for, we'd certainly love to hear from you uh, regarding those. Thank you for attending today's webinar. It's always appreciated to have um, some of your time and interest. Uh, I've put up on the screen for you some additional webinar listings that are in the near future. So if you're interested in any of these, please go ahead and get online at the site listed at the bottom of the screen and sign up for those. And um, we hope to hear from you in the near future. Thank you.